my quest in Bruges, Belgium, was to get to the Church of Our Lady and view Michelangelo's Madonna and Child, which was depicted in the movie The Monument Men, which was loosely based on the novel The Monument Men, Allied Heroes, Nazi Thieves, and the Greatest Treasure Hunt in History by Robert M. Edsel and Brett Witter. You can see some tourists walking up to these brown doors, and we were following them, thinking that this is where we would purchase tickets, but it wasn't. We discovered, and you'll see it circled in red here, that we had to go to a separate kiosk, and that is where we could buy tickets to the church museum and to the Gruthas Museum. The entrance to the church was free of charge. The church tower is 479 feet high. The Church of Our Lady has a long construction history. The first Romanesque church was probably built on this site between 850 and 875 CE. All that remains is a foundation wall. An early Gothic nave was added in the 12th century, around which ambulatory and chapels in the classic French Gothic style were built. The church was refurbished and the interior renovated during the subsequent centuries. This is an older painting of the church. It was in 1589 by Hendrik von Minderhot. And I did not know what a road screen is, so I had to look it up. And it's typically a rich carved wood or stone separating the nave from the chancel of the church. The road screens are found throughout Western Europe and date chiefly from the 14th to 16th centuries. The road screen with the large cross which separates the nave from the choir is especially noteworthy in this painting by Hendrik von Minderhaut. It dates from the end of the 16th century, but made way for the current Baroque road screen in the 18th century. The pulpit is also different from the one you'll see today, and this was painted in 1701 to 1710. As you will notice, there's the, the 1589 painting, the 1701 to 1710 painting, and down below is my photograph from 2022, and you can see the difference of the churches during that time. You'll notice on the left-hand side, two tourists admiring the painting of Our Lady of Perpetual Soccer. On this canvas, the Virgin Mary floats between heaven and earth, surrounded by angels. She mediates between the Holy Trinity above her, God the Father, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit, and the sinners on earth. In the foreground, we see three saints with their characteristic attributes, King David with his crown and scepter, St. Peter with two keys, and St. Mary Magdalene with an oil jar. The choice is not coincidental. The Bible describes how all three sinned and begged God for forgiveness. They eagerly look toward heaven and trust Mary to intercede for them. In front of you, you'll see the pulpit of the church. And in the 16th century, the Protestants succeeded from the Catholic Church. In response, the Catholic Church initiated radical reform, the Counter-Reformation. Greater emphasis was placed on the church teachings and the pulpit was given a prominent place in churches. This early Rococo pulpit is supported by a female figure. She is showing a verse from the book of Proverbs in the Bible and proclaims faith to the world. The rostrum where the preacher stands is decorated with scenes from the New Testament. Angels show the four Gospels. The sounding board that hangs above the pulpit ensures that the faithful could hear the sermon. It is crowned with a sculpture of the truth.
This is the window of the high choir of the church. Left to right is Johannes, Our Lady, Bonifacius, and Alosis. I highlighted with that little red circle that in that encove is the Virgin and Child and the prior chapel of the three women saints. This used to be the chapel of a chamber of rhetoric called the Three Women Saints. Chambers of rhetoric were guilds of playwrights and poets who competed against each other during spectacular performances. The chamber derived its name from three women saints, St. Mary Magdalene, St. Barbara, and St. Catherine of Alexandria. They are depicted in the painting behind the sculpture of the Virgin Mary. All three suffered for their faith, but were rewarded with sainthood. The inscription at the top of the frame references this, Who suffers overcomes. It is no coincidence that this is also the motto of the chamber of the three women saints. Unfortunately, I could not find a clear picture of the painting, and I didn't take one. The only thing that I could find on the website was the following which is not the same painting as the one behind the Virgin Mary, but it gives you a general idea of a depiction of the three saints. The Madonna and Child is made of marble. This sculpture of the Virgin and Child originally stood in St. Donatian's Cathedral, which was situated in Berg Square, but was demolished around 1800. It was probably made by the Bruges sculptor Peter Peppers. The Adoration of the Shepherds was painted in 1662. It's an oil on canvas by Gaspar de Creo. And I'm probably not saying that right. The women kneeling on the right are the patrons who commissioned the work, the abbess Joanna Calabrant and fellow sister. They are worshiping the child. Three saints are seen kneeling in the foreground, Saint Benedict, Saint Bernard, and St. Helena. God can be seen high above in the clouds. The dove in a halo of light symbolizes the Holy Spirit. These colorful late medieval traces were discovered during the church's restoration between 2012 and 2020. Above a red curtain with golden moffets you'll see four angels making music. Around the corner, on a narrow bit of wall, you can recognize Veronica. She is said to have comforted the suffering Christ by wiping the blood and sweat from his face with her veil. You can see how Christ's features are miraculously preserved on the veil. Now this is the back of the church and uh, where people exit. And you'll notice I highlighted another statue. And I was hoping to find something online, but I couldn't. But it is quite lovely. And then we're going to go from here out into the lobby area. And you'll see two women standing in front of another display case. And this is the relic of Ex Branchio of St. Anthony of Abbott. And this is from the 18th century Bruges. This reliquary contains a piece of iron bone from St. Anthony the Abbot. St. Anthony the Abbot, 251 to 356, is a saint of early Christendom. In 1531, Bruce chose him as patron against the plague, the saint who had to protect the city against this terrible epidemic. Here is a painting of uh, St. Anthony in The Temptation of St. Anthony by Jos von Windekens and painted in 1713. The abbot Anthony is already an old man living in a cave in the Libyan desert. Here he is confronted with a vision of demons who are burning in hell. This is one of many chapels throughout the um, church area and also the museum had several different little chapel areas and um, just this one was on the way out of the church. And now we're going into the Church of Our Lady Museum.
To get to the entrance of the church museum, we walked past decorative gates protecting the tombs of Mary of Burgundy and Charles the Bold. This is the prayer chapel of Ludwig of Gruthus, and he was a powerful advisor to the Dukes of Burgundy, and he also lived in a city palace adjacent to this church. In the late 15th century, he had both buildings connected by a two-story prayer chapel. From the upper chapel, the Gruthus family could attend Mass without having to leave their palace. The lower chapel was probably intended for friends or courtiers. The priest could access the upper chapel to administer communion via a staircase. The upper chapel is now part of the Gruthas Museum. The outside of the chapel is decorated with coats of arms and the initials of Louis and his wife, Marguerite of Borse, and his motto, There is more in you. Again, this is the prayer chapel of Ludwig of Gruthas. For anyone that's Catholic, you know what a confessional is. And these were uh, created in 1697. They're made of oak. And ours were not that elaborate in our church. It was just a curtain and a little entryway. So that was all we had. This painting is a triptych. And it's the Adoration of the Shepherds by Peter Porbus, uh, 1574 Bruges, oil on panel. This triptych was commissioned by Jose de Damhauder, and I'm probably saying it wrong. He was a lawyer from Bruges. He is depicted on the left panel together with his four sons. His patron saint, Saint Judoc, is standing behind them. The right panel shows his wife, Louise de Chantrains, and their six daughters, along with her patron saint, St. Louis. Some of the children have a red cross on their forehead. They have already died by the time Porbus painted them. In this close-up of the painting of the Adoration of the Shepherds, you'll notice that one son and three daughters have the red uh, cross on their top of their heads. And that, again, indicates that they had passed away before this painting had been commissioned. In conclusion, the center panel features the Adoration of the Shepherds, a typical nativity scene. And this is the stained glass window that was above the Adoration of the Shepherds by Peter Porbus. This painting is the Transfiguration of Jesus on the Mount Tabor by Jared David, painted in 1505. This work by Jared David depicts the Transfiguration on Mount Tabor, a biblical scene. When Jesus climbs Mount Tabor along with the apostles Peter, John, and James, his face starts to shine like the sun and his clothes take on a bright white glow. The light is so bright that the apostles are unable to look at it, and they fall to the ground in fear. Jesus is flanked by the prophets Moses and Elijah. Above them appears God the Father, who recognizes Jesus as his son. The side panels are not as old as the center panel. Peter Porbus painted them in 1573. So that means that um, Peter Porbus had to adjust his style of painting to match Jared David's painting style. The painting was commissioned by Anselmus de Boot and his wife Johanna Voigt. On the left is the father and his sons, and on the right is the mother and her daughters. The center panel shows Peter, John, and James falling to the ground, unable to look at Jesus whose clothes and face glow. Above him is Moses, Elijah, and God the Father. In this close-up of the two side panels, you'll notice there are red X's on the heads indicating which children had died. Three sons and one daughter died before the painting had been commissioned. 
This is the stained glass window that was above the Transfiguration of Jesus on Mount Tabor by Jared David in 1505. Around 1270, it became customary in Bruges to paint the inside of brick-lined graves. The scenes show what medieval people thought about the afterlife. The virgin and child are usually depicted at the foot end. She intercedes with God on behalf of the deceased. The crucified Christ is portrayed at the head end, bringing redemption to humanity through his death. On the side walls, angels with incense burners accompany the deceased soul to heaven. In the Middle Ages, the dead were often buried the same day they died, so the tomb painter had to work quickly. Crouching in the grave, he painted freehand on wet, quick-drying lime. As a result, the drawings are quite rudimentary. Our Lady of Seven Sorrows is by Adrian Eisenbrandt, 1528-1535, Bruges, Oil on Canvas. According to Catholic tradition, Mary, the mother of Jesus, experienced seven moments of profound sadness, the so-called seven sorrows. They are all depicted in this work, arranged around a portrait of the suffering Mary. The first sorrow was the prophecy of Simeon. The second, the flight to Egypt. Third, the losing of the Holy Child in Jerusalem. Four, the meeting with Jesus on his way to Calvary. Five, standing at the foot of the cross. Six, our Lord being taken from the cross. Seven, the burial of Christ. This is The Last Supper by Peter Porbus, painted in 1562. The red-headed man seated with his back to the viewer is Judas. These are the tombs of Mary of Burgundy and her father, Charles the Bold. After falling from her horse, Mary of Burgundy died on March 27, 1482, at the Prinzenhof, the Duke's Palace in Bruges. She was just 25 years old, but had ruled the Low Countries since the death of her father, Charles the Bold, in 1477. She was buried in the Church of Our Lady at her express request. Her husband, Maximilian of Austria, commissioned this tomb monument in 1490. It's designed in a Gothic style, the side panels feature her family tree on her mother's and her father's side. Her epitaph is carved into the head and foot ends, listing the territories over which she ruled and featuring her coat of arms. Charles the Bold died in 1477. While the design of Charles the Bold's tomb is very similar to that of his daughter, it was made 70 years later and part of it are already in the Renaissance style. You can see by this, among other things, the nymphs that bear his shield and by the style of the armor. Passion Triptych Charles the Bold's granddaughter, Margaret of Austria, originally commissioned this triptych for the tomb of her husband. Filiberto, Duke of Savoy. Unfortunately, her court painter, Bernard of Oxley, died before he could complete it. It was completed with by Marcus Gerard. The painting was later transferred to Bruges, where Marcus Gerard, the elder, finished the side panels. The chancel was refurbished for the occasion. New choir gates and the passion triptych were added. This painting is called The Procession of the Brotherhood of Our Lady of Snows by Anton Classens, 1575. This painting depicts Our Lady of the Snows, a reference to a fourth century legend. 
Mary is said to have caused a miraculous snowfall on Mount Esquilin, one of the famous seven hills of Rome, in the middle of summer. She wanted to indicate that a church, the Santa Maria Maggiore, should be built for her on that spot. In the foreground, you can see the procession of the Brotherhood of Our Lady of Snows. This Bruges-based brotherhood had its own chapel in this church. Among its members were well-known and wealthy citizens of Bruges, including the painter Hans Memling. The Calling of Matthew by Jacob von Oost, 1st, 1640. Matthew was a tax collector. One day Jesus walked by and told him, Come and follow me. Jacob von Oost portrays this moment beautifully. And you can see that in this painting, uh, Jesus is beckoning Matthew to follow him, and Matthew shows surprise, uh, a surprise reaction to Jesus' request. The Procession of the Blessed Sacrament by Anton Clasens. The Guild of the Blessed Sacrament consists of 12 dignitaries of Bruges and its dean. Uh, this is the Adoration of the Magi by Gerald Se Segers, 1630. And in the background, everyone jostles to catch a glimpse of the newborn Christ child, but the atmosphere is more hushed around Jesus and his mother. The three kings are dressed in lavish, colorful garments and have brought gifts. One of them kneels in front of the manger to receive Jesus' blessing. Only one of Michelangelo's sculptures left Italy during his lifetime, this Madonna and Child. Jean Mascron, a scion of wealthy Bruges-based family of cloth traders, purchased the work from Michelangelo in 1506 for the sum of 100 ducats. In 1514, it was installed in a sculpted altar in the south nave of the Church of Our Lady. Several members of the Mosquin family are buried at the foot of the altar. They stipulated in a document that the sculpture should never be moved, but history decided otherwise. Napoleon seized the Madonna for his National Museum in Paris. The statue returned to Bruges in 1850 after his defeat at Waterloo. During World War II, the Madonna was stolen a second time. This time, Hitler wanted it for his large museum in Linz. The Allied Monument men recovered the sculpture, along with several other valuable artworks from the Altassi salt mines in Austria. My quest to view Michelangelo's Madonna and Child, depicted in the movie The Monument Men, which was loosely based on the novel The Monument Men, Allied Heroes, Nazi Thieves, and the Greatest Treasure Hunt in History, by Robert M. Edsel and Brett Witter, was successful. My quest completed. It's time to leave the Church of Our Lady for another adventure. Thank you for watching Mary's Eclectic Interests. Take care and stay safe.